Hey guys, welcome to part two of your 15-3 notes. We're going to be talking now about social mobility. And social mobility was the idea that in Chinese society, you could move from one social class to another. Um, so basically in, in China, you weren't just stuck in whatever social class that you were born into, which was the case in some other places in the world at the time. So the Chinese believed that the best way to do this was to get an education and become a government official. Uh, and when I say to get an education and become a government official, I mean for a man in the family to do so. At this time, uh, women would not have been allowed to do that. All right, so the family life in China, um, extended family was very common in Chinese society. So that's, you know, multiple generations of a family living within the same home. And the reason this was so common was because large families were needed for farming. Okay, um, the more hands that you have on the farm, um, the easier life is going to be for you. So um, it was especially common for peasant families to have these large extended families living together. Um, in fact, there was a saying among the peasants in China um, that went, extra mouths come with two hands. So even though, you know, having another child, bringing more children into the family uh, would cause another mouth to feed, uh, well, hey, that also comes with two more hands to be able to work. Um, unfortunately, um, like many other places during this time, a lot of young people died from various different diseases and not all children made it into adulthood. And that's why uh, it was also very common for families to have large amounts of children is because just because, you know, they were born did not necessarily mean that they would survive into adulthood. And uh, extended family is still common in China today. So even today in China, it's um, very common to see multiple generations of a family living together. So, you know, like grandparents, the mom and dad, the kids, maybe an aunt and uncle, all living within the same home. All right, now let's talk about a concept called filial piety. So um, filial piety is basically the idea that children should give their parents complete obedience and respect, okay? So um, Chinese children were taught from a young age that they needed to put um, the interests of their families above the interest of their own selves, okay? So um, basically, filial piety is the respect for parents and even ancestors. They considered, you know, if you didn't respect your parents, if you didn't honor your ancestors, that you were shaming the family. So filial piety was considered to be the first virtue in Chinese culture, meaning the most important virtue for all Chinese was this idea of filial piety. Um, filial piety was also uh, advocated for by a man named Confucius who uh, was very important in Chinese society, and he believed that the principle of filial piety was necessary for establishing a good society. So he did not think that a society or a country or an empire would flourish without this idea of filial piety being practiced by all the people that lived there. All right, so to sort of break down what fili filial piety means, it means to be good to your parents, to take care of your parents in their old age, to um, practice good conduct in your day-to-day -day life so you can bring honor to your family, and to perform whatever job that you had to the best of your ability so um, you can, number one, provide for your family, and number two, honor your family. It also meant to be obedient to your parents and not rebellious. And when I say obedient, they expected complete obedience. So children did not backtalk. Children did exactly what their parents said when their parents said to do it. Filial piety also meant to show love, respect, support, and courtesy to others. It also meant to ensure male heirs. So basically for a woman to produce a son, which obviously there's a lot more science to it than that, but they believed um, if... A woman could not produce a son, then it was not showing filial piety. Um, you're supposed to uphold fraternity among brothers, wisely advise your parents, and dissuade them from poor or immoral decisions, and display sorrow if your parents were sick, and carry out sacrifices to honor them after their death. So there's sort of a lot to filial piety, but basically, just to break it down very simply for you, the main thing that was involved in filial piety 
was showing respect and obedience to your parents always. Um, here's a story of filial piety. I'm not going to read it to you now, but you can look at it uh, by yourself on the slideshow later if you would like to. Okay, so uh, filial piety also included respect for ancestors. So um, the Chinese believe that if you failed to respect your ancestors, it could lead to bad luck or misfortune for your family. Um, let's talk about marriages now in China. So marriages in China were arranged by parents. So the people who were actually getting married didn't really have any say in the matter. Um, uh, different families would come together and they would basically, you know, ask each other, how would, you know, my daughter marrying your son benefit both of our families? And they would um, provide matches um, based on basically how those uh, marriages could benefit the families. So there wasn't necessarily love involved in these marriage decisions. Um, it mostly uh, just involved, you know, how those marriages could benefit the families. Uh, marriages also uh, were consulted by the ancestors. So basically, you know, they would ask their ancestors for guidance in um, coming up with these matches for people to be married. The bride's family, so whoever the bride was and the people getting married, uh, the bride's family would often receive a dowry, which is a gift of money or livestock. So um, how that would work is the, the husband's family, um, he would give this gift of money or livestock to the bride's family as a way of saying, um, you know, this is basically our payment or our tribute to your family for giving up your daughter for her to become part of our family. And then the bride would move in with her husband's family. And once she moved in with her husband's family, she was expected to uh, show complete obedience to her husband's mother or her mother-in-law. And her mother-in-law was supposed to basically teach her the ways of the family. All right, we are going to stop um, right there, and I will see you guys in part three of your 15-3 notes in the next video.